Awesome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Content Security Policy, a successful mess between hardening and mitigation. Uh, we're super happy to be here today. Uh, this is Miki. Uh, my name is Lucas. Uh, we're both from Google Switzerland. And uh, yeah, Hawaii is awesome. Really enjoying this conference. <laughs> so it was really worth the travel. Um, OK, we have a pretty stuffed agenda today. Uh, we have some general recommendations that should be usable for, for developers and security experts. But we also have some pretty advanced topics uh, where we go uh, very much into detail. So uh, if there's questions, feel free to ask them at the end, or we're around at the conference. So we're happy to chat about CSP 24-7 uh, just to grab us. Um, yes, so Mickey will start with vulnerability trends, and I'll take over in a bit. This is forward. This is the forward. Okay, great. Uh, okay, hi everyone. So uh, we'd like to start with real-world data. So we uh, uh, focus on cross-site scripting or XSS vulnerabilities, right? And this is also what, uh, what we, we we aim for when we mean CSP. Uh, CSP is this like huge umbrella security header, which are, was originally thought as like solving many of web security issues. But we focus on S XSS in all our previous talks and in these talks too. So we wanted to start with real-world data, and uh, what we have is uh, like all the XSS vulnerabilities is reported to us to Google in the vulnerability work program since 2014 and you can see that like around two-thirds of them uh, are actually web application uh, web platform bugs and drilling down in these web platform bugs uh, we see that approximately three quarters are cross-site scripting uh, XSS vulnerabilities so XSS is, is a major problem and uh, this is reflected also outside of Google in uh, other sources of data uh, other uh, bug bounties or vulnerability reward programs. So for example, HackerOne uh, has similar results and also Mozilla. Uh, in Mozilla, bugs reported to Mozilla, we see that XSS is actually the top um, vulnerability reported there. So uh, there is need of defense in that in this field, um, mostly because the uh, web mostly because the web platform is not secure by default. Unfortunately we are still not there. So it is important, especially for very sensitive uh, web applications, to uh, have some kind of defense in depth mechanism in case the primary security, security mechanism, which should not be neglected at all, and actually people should focus on them in case they fail. Uh, and we'd like to spend a word on uh, what we call mitigations, because mitigation is a very complex and overloaded word. Uh, it actually comes mostly, the first mitigations in computer security are in the, uh, let's say, uh, memory safety world. Um, so mostly for mitigating exploitation of buffer overflows and so on, right? And when we uh, talk about web mitigation techniques, these are a little bit more, more recent, more modern. So uh, we believe there are, uh, no mitigations are made equal. And there are some uh, good mitigations and some mitigations that are less good and uh, I'd like to start with them first. So some mitigations aim to just raise the bar. Uh, so they have an economy, and um, in the, their mindset is based on an economy of cost. They want to make costly for an attacker uh, to exploit a vulnerability. Uh, they want to slow down the attacker. Uh, so in, in this case, in the web world, uh, I would say that a traditional CSP, uh, which you might have uh, seen or read in our previous papers and talks, the whitelist-based CSPs are automatically bypassable. Also, as Jim said earlier on, more than 95% they're automatically bypassable. Uh, so uh, you, an attacker has just to find a, a bypass in the whitelist to exploit the same bug. Right, the same bug that was there. So in this way, the, the, the uh, mitigation technique did not really reduce the attack surface. But on the other hand, good mitigation techniques are the ones that also reduce the attack surface by, for example, disabling unsafe APIs. So for example, not having unsafe evil, uh, we'll see later the details in a CSP policy, means that all evil-based XSS uh, cannot happen. So this is an actual reduction of attack surface. And this is what we call a good mitigation. There are other examples, like for non-space CSP, but we'll see later uh, in, in great details. Uh, another important thing is good mitigations should actually induce hardening, what we call hardening of the application from a code point of view. Uh, for example, uh, CSP, uh, a, a good CSP actually um, 
uh, induces the developer to, for example, refactor inline event handlers, which are bad for security, or to use uh, contextual autoescaping templating systems, which greatly uh, increases the security with respect to uh, reflected XSS. So uh, with this, I um, go through a little bit more in detail at which kind of XSS uh, were blocked at Google by CSP. So this is real world data. It's the first time we present uh, with this detail. Um, so um, coverage of CSP at Google. So uh, this effort has been mostly three years. And in three years, we uh, are covering 62% of all outgoing Google traffic uh, with an enforcing non-spaced CSP. Uh, and uh, these are more than 80 Google domains. So Google has a lot of domains, uh, subdomains, as you might, might uh, guess. But 80 is still a pretty significant number, and more than 160 services. And for very sensitive domains, the traffic coverage with what we call strict CSP is very close to 100%. And the number of services that have almost total coverage uh, of uh, strict CSP is uh, around 70%. Um, how many XSSs that were reported to us got blocked uh, by CSP? So in 2018, um, more than 60% uh, of XSSs that got reported to us got uh, mitigated successfully by our CSP. Uh, so uh, among 11 XSS vulnerabilities on very sensitive domains, uh, seven of them, which is around 78%, uh, got successfully prevented uh, by CSP. And uh, taking into account all the 69 XSS vulnerabilities on sensitive domains, we have around 60%. So here in numbers with pie charts, on the left, very sensitive domains. On the right, uh, all the sensitive domains. Uh, and going a little bit more in detail, on the very sensitive domains, 11 XSSs got reported. Of them, nine were happening on endpoints that were covered by CSP. And CSP coverage is actually uh, a problem. Maybe we'll go into that a little bit later, uh, because it's important to cover all, or end, all of your endpoints with CSP. And of these uh, nine, seven were uh, mitigated by CSP. And the other two uh, that were injection in the SFC attribute of script could have been mitigated by what we call an additional whitelist policy. So we'll see later. This is a pretty advanced thing. Uh, we're not going full circle and advocating for whitelist-based policies. So please uh, bear with us, and we'll, we'll show you exactly what we mean. Um, and of the two that were not covered by CSP, they could, uh, the access could have been mitigated by, by uh, CSP. We see here a, a detail of uh, our XSS got reported in uh, 2018. Uh, we see here the, um, the uh, causes, the root causes, um, what they were exp uh, being exploited via. And there are many, uh, many um, uh, sinks or injection points. But what I'd like to highlight is that JavaScript URI plus inline event handlers uh, plus data URI uh, make up for approximately one third of the uh, injection points. And so having uh, a CSP that just didn't contain the unsafe inline keyword that actually covers uh, these sinks, as shown in this uh, table, uh, would be uh, enough to actually mitigate successfully for one third of the vulnerabilities. Um, this was also slightly surprising for us. It's pretty pretty cool confirmation. So uh, in this table, we have uh, excess sinks on the left. And what makes CSP successfully block them? Uh, so there is not really a one-on-one mapping of this, to be completely honest. Uh, but uh, this is good enough to, to give an idea. So for example, for JavaScript uh, URI, uh, it's just not having a safe inline. It's enough to block them. The same for data, and the same for inline event handlers. So, um, then we have inner HTML context that can be either uh, inner or not inner HTML context, which means either a reflected XSS that gets reflected by a server or a programmatic injection in uh, the inner HTML property of a DOM element. And, and both are prevented by not having unsafe inline in the policy. Then we have evil, which is governed by the unsafe evil um, um, directive, uh, sorry, keyword. And then we have injections in the text of a script tag, which also here can be both programmatic and reflected. Uh, CSP helps if we, non uh, sorry, if we hash the script or if we 
nonce and manually nonce it. Uh, so strict dynamics makes adoption easier, uh, but also makes trust propagation. And we'll see later what it means. So not having strict dynamic and manually nouncing is the way to uh, protect against injection the text of the script. And it's very likely the same for the SRC attribute of the script. Uh, then we have some kind of complex web frameworks that do some uh, symbolic execution or they try to parse and they have their own templating languages, but we'll not go uh, into that now. And here I pass to Lucas for some more details. Yes, so uh, thank you so much, Miki. Um, in this section, we would like to introduce some common CSP recipes that you as developers or security engineers can reuse. Um, they basically are ordered by the ease of deployment and uh, by the amount of syncs they're covering. Uh, everything we talk about in this section is about non-space CSP, and I will give a very quick intro about that as well. And uh, it's a kind of a mix of like high-level stuff, like just use this policy and you will get these guarantees versus like a really detailed explanation of like uh, what kind of guarantees you will get for that, right? So that you not just like blindly trust the CSP because people say, yes, they have a CSP, but what does it mean, right? They could just uh, allow everything or they can also have a default source non-policy that blocks everything, right? It really doesn't tell you anything. So uh, the obligatory slide on why not the whitelist, I feel like almost like a broken record on Twitter uh, telling people to not use whitelist anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the thing is, uh, usually they're trivially bypassable because uh, as uh, Jim already mentioned, we did a study a couple years ago uh, based on the Google search index. We took all the CSP policies we found. Uh, almost all of them were whitelist based. And as soon as you know, a couple of JSMP endpoints or uh, AngularJS libraries hosted on popular DNS, uh, CDNs, you basically can bypass all of them, right? And even if you host, if you only allow self, as soon as you have like a, you know, a JSMP endpoint or you host some AngularJS library, uh, it also makes your policy completely bypassable. So basically with a whitelist, you tie the security to the policy not being bypassable per se, rather than actually closing a sync. And uh, there's a couple of talks we had in the past, so there's links in the bottom, you can uh, look them up later. We'll not cover this topic uh, any, into any more detail today. Uh, what we will cover is non-space CSP. And I just wanted to ask the audience, uh, have you heard about non-space CSP before? Is it the first time? Awesome, some hands up. Nice. Um, so just a quick uh, uh, recap. The idea is basically only scripts that have a random nonce attribute that is random per response will be allowed to execute. And this nonce value in the script tag has to match the nonce value in the response header, the content security policy response header. Only then the browser will execute this script tag. So in that case, if you have a markup injection and the attacker injects a script with an invalid nonce or without a nonce, the browser will block this script from executing. So CSP is a client-side defense and depth strategy, right? Um, so non-space CSP has been around since many years. It was actually introduced in CSP2, but it was not really picked up uh, by anyone. The reason is that this is very hard to deploy in uh, uh, normal applications. So in CSP3, uh, strict dynamic got added. It's uh, a small modification it basically uh, instructs the browser to only allow, or to also allow scripts to execute that are uh, created dynamically within an already trusted script. So this makes a huge difference because uh, the only thing you have to do now is actually nonce scripts in the response body, and you don't have to nonce all the scripts in your application. And that's especially important if you, for example, load widgets from third-party sites where you don't control the JavaScript, right? If they do like a dynamic script creation, uh, you will not be able to make them pass the nonce. Or you can file a feature request and hope that they do it, but uh, usually that's a, a blocker otherwise. So um, what we'll focus in this part is basically uh, incremental rollout of content security policy. Rolling out CSP is often a trade-off between the amount of syncs, XSS syncs you're actually covering with your policy and the effort to roll out the policy, which is mostly the, the refactoring work you have to do. If you remove a sync, right, like if you remove an unsafe uh, API like evil, you have to make sure that the application is not using this sync, right, otherwise it will break. 
So there is a refactoring effort. And uh, the, the, the refactoring is mostly based on the type of CSP, like how many things you're closing, and your application, of course, like the size of your application, the amount of inline event handlers, the code quality, et cetera. So uh, we came up with a couple of templates that basically uh, we mapped on the following slides to the table that Mickey presented you before. Um, so if you start at the bottom, you basically have uh, a lot of remaining attack surface, but it's very easy to adopt. If you go further up, it's harder to adopt, but you cover more things. And uh, the, the goal is eventually to get up to a nonce only policy, I guess. Um, but not, it is not possible in every application, right? Um, so, and since it's local Mokosec, we also have a level one CSP that uses like brand new CSP free features that haven't been presented anywhere else yet, I think. Um, it's uh, very interesting for some use cases, but usually I would recommend to start either with a level two, level three CSP, and if you can, move up to a non only CSP. So, uh, level two CSP is like an arbitrary definition we choose for uh, a non-spaced CSP that has strict dynamic and also unsafe eval. It's kind of a sweet spot because it's uh, kind of easy to roll out uh, because the refactoring effort is uh, kind of manageable, but it covers a lot of very common XSS things. As a matter of fact, this type of policy is uh, uh, set on 60% uh, of all the outgoing uh, uh, Google traffic on sensitive domains, and that was the one that Mickey meant uh, with uh, which pre uh, mitigated c between 60 and 80% of the XSS. So it's a good starting point, but if you can, you should uh, you know, go further. Uh, the nice thing is, uh, because it's a non-space policy, it mitigates all the classical reflected and stored XSS in your application, right? Um, and it also works if you don't control all the JavaScript yourself. If you have a widget that you load from Facebook, Twitter, Google Analytics, whatever, and these widgets uh, create, dynamically create script tags, they would still work uh, with this type of policy. And there is good browser support, which is also nice. Um, the drawbacks of this type of policy is you still haven't covered the evil sync, um, and since there's strict dynamic, uh, a portion of the DOM XSS is still uncovered. So here's a, uh, uh, the, the list of the things that are covered. JavaScript URIs are covered because this policy does not have unsafe inline. It might have unsafe inline, but this is just for browser backward compatibility. Every browser that supports nonces will drop unsafe inline implicitly in the uh, presence of a nonce. Uh, also, data URIs are covered because there's no unsafe inline. The HTML injection to HTML context and internet HTML context is also covered because every script tag needs to have a nonce to be executed. Um, evil is not covered because you have unsafe evil in that policy. Um, and then there's a very interesting section, which is uh, uh, injection into script uh, text and script SRC. So if you have code that does like create element script, .src and then assign some user controlled input or uh, it's, uh, script dot inner text assigning to user controlled input. That's uh, not really covered because uh, strict dynamic dynamic propagates trust to these child scripts. Uh, inline scripts would be covered if you replace this with a hash. Um, yes, and also AngularJS like template injections are not covered because uh, these happen entirely in JavaScript and uh, CSP basically has uh, no access to that. So in this case, we really recommend just to move away from AngularJS because it's uh, kind of broken and you should use like Angular 2 and up uh, because they have a, a offline template compilation which doesn't have these kind of bugs. So uh, that's very interesting. What kind of refactorings you have to do to make your application compatible to this type of level two CSP? Uh, first, you have, to remove in, uh, you have to remove JavaScript URIs uh, second, you have to refactor inline event handlers. Usually you remove them and instead use the JavaScript API to register event handlers. Uh, it's usually not a lot of work, but if you have a lot of inline event handlers, it, it can sum up, right? Uh, and the other thing you have to do is you have to basically nonce all the script tags that are in the response body, not the dynam dynamically created ones. This uh, just works because of strict dynamic and that basically is a huge, uh, advantage in terms of uh, refactoring. So 
uh, one step further, level three CSP is non-spaced, plus strict dynamic, no unsafe eval. Uh, exactly the same properties, just that you basically now have only the, the DOM XSS syncs um, that are going through the script text, uh, uh, script inner text and script SOC. Eval is covered by this policy. Um, so also almost the same refactoring steps. You just, in case you have evil, you have to refactor it to something else. Like if you do it, use it for JSON parsing, you can use the native browser APIs, JSON.parse. If you do module loading, you can like create child scripts. Um, and there's also a very interesting variant of this uh, type of policy, which is actually hash-based and not non-spaced. Uh, this policy is extremely useful for static or single page applications, which are static, and you don't want to have a nonce on a static page because nonces should not be cached, and if you have a nonce on a static page, it's not static anymore, right? So what you can do is you can replace the nonce with a hash of a kind of a bootloader script, and you do the same refactoring steps as before, but you basically move all these source scripts into the bootloader script and just like, uh, you know, dynamically load them. By that, script dynamic will make sure that these kind of things are allowed, and um, only, script, only that one script will be allowed to execute in the initial markup because that is the hashed one. And uh, if you know the CSP evaluator, it actually uses this kind of policy because it's also a static site. You can uh, check out the, the page code and uh, look at it as an example. And uh, then there is kind of the, the holy grail for non-spaced CSP, which is a nonce-only policy. Uh, why? Because it actually really covers uh, the vast majority of XSS syncs that are uh, tractable for CSP. Uh, it's supported by all major browsers, even Safari, and um, it's very nice property, has very nice pro properties because it basically means every script is running was explicitly marked as trusted uh, by a developer with a nonce uh, value, right? So um, on the other hand, the drawback is that you now have to nonce all the scripts which means you need to have some nonce propagation mechanisms to dynamically created scripts, right? So what you now have to, to do is, oh, sorry, skipping ahead one slide, I'll show you that in a second. What you now have to do is, you also have to do like a set attribute nonce on dynamically created scripts. Uh, looks easy, might be easy in your application, but if you use a lot of external widgets or uh, you do like very complex stuff, this can uh, become a lot of work and maybe even impossible if you don't control all the JavaScript code. Um, in terms of the covered XSS things, this policy performs uh, really well. Um, the only injections that are left are like, you know, if you, if the developer marks something as trusted with the nonce and then they still put like a user input into a script uh, in the script SOC, then that's still exploitable, right? Uh, but there's no automatic propagation of nonces in this model. Um, and also very important to note here, you must not add a whitelist here now, right? Because then it's an or thing, either a nonce or a whitelist. That would make the policy bypassable. Um, yes, so here's a nice overview uh, of all, all these properties. And uh, there's also a column for trusted types, which is a talk uh, held by Kotro in the afternoon, Christoph Kotovic, and it's really awesome because it uh, is very well performing on all the DOM XSS uh, parts, and uh, it complements CSP perfectly, right? Uh, trusted types is uh, a GS-based uh, hardening, and it doesn't apply for stored or reflected XSS server side. For that, you would need to have CSP as a mitigation, but for the client side code, it's, it's really awesome. So really recommend going to that talk as well. Um, yeah, CSP coverage at Google, we already mentioned that to some extent. The only thing I want to highlight here is uh, we basically, all our, our services that are covered by CSP uh, started with a level two CSP. And then uh, last summer we started to slowly upgrading to level four CSPs with Evil. And uh, just this year we also started to upgrade um, the policies to remove evil, so almost 10% uh, of the outgoing traffic has a level four policy now for Google. Um, and we mostly do this for super sensitive services, but uh, even, the, even the just level two CSP was uh, quite effective in mitigating quite a lot of uh, XSS, 
externally ex reported XSS attacks for Google. Uh, here's an example of, uh, like a very short example of uh, domains that already have it. Uh, for example, photos.google.com has a level four CSP. It's a very complicated application. It's totally doable. It just takes a bit of time and dedication. And yes, we prioritized by domain tiers. So very sensitive domains got the most attention and uh, they almost are almost 100%, like I think 96% uh, covered by a level two CSP. And the level four CSP is there on already 4%. So with that, we move to uh, advanced CSP techniques. Um, some of that is really advanced, uh, but it's also quite novel. And I, uh, we thought like LocomoposSec is probably the audience to present that, right? So uh, new in CSP3, there is uh, two new directives, which is script source element and script source attribute. Um, same thing for styles, but we'll talk about that later. The, the difference is it's like script source, but these two basically uh, cover different parts of the, what the script source directive would cover. Script source element just covers uh, script tags, right? Inline scripts and source scripts. And script source attribute covers uh, all the script execution that happens through uh, attributes in uh, HTML tags, right? Like inline event handlers or JavaScript UIs. Uh, why is this uh, useful? Because through this uh, thing, you now can uh, use hashes of attributes, like hashed inline event handlers or hashed JavaScript URIs, and explicitly bless a couple of inline event handlers. So if you have a site where you, for some reason, cannot refactor some inline event handlers, uh, with this type of policy, you would still be able to roll out CSP without breaking your site. Um, it's not the thing I would uh, shoot for first, but uh, it's definitely uh, an interesting development. It's, as I said, it's brand new and it's only supported in Chrome 75. That's also a limitation. Uh, other browser browsers will probably follow, but it will take a bit of time. Uh, the big benefit of that policy is that there's like almost no refactoring required. And um, of course, having this policy is strictly better than having no CSP, right? because the classical reflected XSS, uh, uh, server-side XSS are still covered by this policy. Uh, drawback is, of course, that uh, this policy covers uh, not all the things that uh, good non-space CSP could cover, right? And in case of an HTML injection, there's also a culprit here, because if you hash uh, inline event handlers, uh, in an injection, you could re an attacker could reuse these event handlers as long as they are hashed. So if you have an inline event handler that is like a delete user, uh, and then there's a markup injection, and someone injects like a image tag x, source x, uh, on error delete user, that would ex execute, right? If you just uh, whitelist uh, return false or JavaScript wait zero, that is uh, not really relevant, but this is very important to mention here. Um, and yeah, the attacker doesn't have full script execution in that case, but it's uh, still a thing, right? Uh, I can't go into detail because of time reasons, but here's a small POC that you can try out yourself if you want to learn more about it. Uh, the covered syncs are similar to the level two CSP, but now here the inline event handlers also have like a tilde because depending on what you hash, um, you have a different security guarantees. The nice thing about this policy although is that you can actually use this for static content and auto-generate the policy. So if you have static content, you could have a proxy that hashes inline event handlers and puts nonces and generate the CSP for that on the fly. That's the first time that this is possible. Um, but it should be static content, right? And not something that has templates or user controllable input or whatever. Uh, refactoring is really easy. It's just basically adding nonces to scripts uh, in the response body and uh, hashing these things. So yes, that's a new thing in CSP3. And then there is also something else that is uh, pretty useful sometimes, uh, which is uh, double policies or multiple CSP policies. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but you can actually send more than one CSP header in a single response. Uh, why would you do this? Um, because it basically allows you to really add even more constraints to what the policy allows. Uh, usually, if you have only one, po one uh, script source directive and you put nonce random and self in the same directive, 
it's an OR operation, right? A script will execute if any of these uh, requirements are fulfilled. If you set these as uh, two separate policies, they will be enforced independently by the browser, and the script, in order to execute, has to pass both policies. Uh, and you can either set uh, double or multiple policies by having separate headers, separate content security policy headers, or you have a single content security policy header and separate them with a comma. Uh, this looks basically like that. If you comma separate them, it's very important to not confuse that with the semicolon, right? Um, but this is a HTTP, HTTP header specification. Multiple value headers are separated by commas. Uh, so what does this thing do? There's two CSPs, one is a whitelist, and the other one is a non-spaced CSP, and the script will only execute if it fulfills both properties, uh, or if it fulfills the properties of both policies. In that case, this script executes because it has the random nonce, and in that case, and it also executes because uh, the script is sourced from the same domain. In the second and the third example, the script does not execute because here's mi the nonce is missing, and here it's not the same domain source. Um, so if you would basically merge this into here, into single policy, all of these would execute, right? So this is really the nice thing about this type of policy. And uh, we use this in a couple of places at Google, and it has the nice uh, feature that actually also non-scripts that get redirected would be covered by this policy, uh, and also injection into script SRC uh, are much more limited to what they can do. Uh, the drawback is, of course, now you have to have a non-space policy and you need to maintain a whitelist, right, which is uh, actually quite complex. So not the first thing I would shoot for, but uh, for high-sensitivity applications, definitely worth uh, looking into. And it also reflects here, right, it's, uh, it's actually pretty strong. Um, and yes, so almost done with the Guru section. Uh, last bit is uh, what about style injections, like if you have a markup injection, you don't only can inject script tags, of course, right? You can also inject style tags. And because of uh, CSS3, there's some pretty advanced attacks you can carry out. You see, they are using uh, CSS selectors or import uh, statements. Uh, the very important thing to mention here is that uh, these only work in style blocks or sourced styles, and they don't work in inline styles. So what you can do, is you can use style source nonce and a random token to basically enforce a nonce on all the style tags. Um, that is the preferred solution, of course. But since inline styles are so uh, frequently used, it's a refactoring nightmare, right? So you can use the, the new CSP3 directive for styles and basically enforce the nonces just for the style blocks while allowing arbitrary inline, inline styles, right? Um, this is a mitigation strategy, right? But you definitely uh, block the more powerful CSS selectors and import statements. Um, and of course, this policy can be, or this policy can be combined with script source policies. And with that, I will head over, head over to Mickey for the productionizing CSP part, and we're almost done. Awesome. Um, so now we talk about um, what you'd actually deploy uh, CSP in your website. You'd like to see what's going on. So what is being blocked uh, and if there are more refactoring steps needed or if there are some, even some attacks and you want to be aware of them. So um, normally you can put a report to your eye and a so-called CSP violation report is sent by the browser every time a resource is blocked to your collection endpoint. And then you can you know, store them in a database and then look at them. Uh, it is very helpful in this case to add the report sample uh, keyword. This makes, uh, instructs the browser to add uh, a sample of the blocked JavaScript, actually the first 40 bytes in the script sample property. And this is really, really cool because you can actually distinguish be, uh, between actual uh, things that need to be refactored uh, from, for example, extension noise, which are false positives. Um, here I want to be really, really quick about CSP fallbacks. So uh, CSP has been designed uh, in uh, like across many years and the browser's support of CSP is a little fragmented so it's important to have a backward compatible CSP policies that actually uh, falls open on older browsers. So uh, you can take a look at that uh, later but 
very simply, I'll just say two rules. Uh, unsafe inline is uh, ignored in presence of a nonce or a hash, uh, and any whitelist is ignored in presence of strict dynamic. Uh, everything else is, is, is more advanced. So for example, uh, the um, strict dynamic uh, policy that we presented earlier with the nonce and strict dynamic, which should be just nonce and strict dynamic for CSP3 compatible browsers like uh, modern Chrome, Chromium, uh, Firefox, uh, Opera, and so on, uh, actually uh, sometimes is presented with HTTPS, which is a broad whitelist, and a safe inline. So why? This is very confusing, right? But uh, this makes it so that the same policy actually works on, across all browsers. So uh, browsers that do not uh, understand uh, strict dynamic uh, actually uh, see HTTPS uh, because strict dynamic makes the whitelist disappear, uh, and browsers that do not uh, understand anything just have a fail open policy, which is with the unsafe in line. Of course, it doesn't provide any security guarantee, but it does not break your site. Sorry about that. So um, this is very overwhelming, right? Uh, so CSP is, is a mess, right? It's, it, is, it is a mess uh, for us too, and we worked uh, on it for more than three years. Uh, um, it, it, it has a lot of complexity, like so many directives, so many gotchas, like there is this and there is that. Uh, this makes this no longer work, and I saw you enjoy the comma a lot. Um, it's really, really hard. Uh, but what I, I'd like to, to make very clear is that you don't need to know all of this. Uh, you don't need to go through all the levels and variants of CSP that we presented. But to have a reasonable amount of security for your web application, you can actually, uh, you can actually get it pretty simply. And what we suggest is to start with a strict dynamic um, policy. Um, uh, and a, a, a level two uh, policy is um, a good trade-off between uh, security and ease of adoption. Uh, if possible, upgrade to nonce only. This makes it even better. But actually, as uh, we said already, 60 to 80 percent of XSSs at Google in 2018 were already uh, blocked by a strict dynamic-based uh, XSS. Um, and the usual reminder, CSP is a defense in depth mechanism, so you should fix the bugs. You should not just put slap. <laughs> yes. We say it every time. Like, you should not just slap a policy on it, right? Uh, it's very important. It's very important. Uh, it's not an excuse not to fix the underlying bugs, right? And uh, please take, uh, also verify your policy with the CSP evaluator tool, which focuses on XSS protection. So very briefly, uh, wrapping up, Please use announced-based CSP policies with strict dynamic if you care about access protections. Um, um, sorry, that was level three, it was not level two. Um, if you can without a unsafe evil, depends. Uh, and uh, if uh, possible, upgrade to nonce only, so if, which is our level four. Also maybe add the fallbacks, which makes it harder to read. Um, and mahalo, thank yeah. you very much. Thank, thank you so much, everyone. If you have any questions, please. <laughs> Oh, cool. Awesome. So can you describe the amount of time, energy, and process that went into refactoring the JavaScript code at Google in order to broadly, adopt, broadly support CSP? Well, um, yes, it took a long time. Um, can we have the questions also on the, on the screen, maybe? OK, no worries. So um, it depends. So for the strict dynamic-based content security policy, the refactoring was mostly focused on removing inline event handlers and less so on uh, refactoring JavaScript. For upgrading to a nonce-only policy, it almost took us like, I think, 12 or 18 months to basically refactor all the libraries at Google to do nonce passing um, and basically teach the frameworks to do it, right? Uh, now we're at a spot where we basically just have a framework that has a nonce-only policy and uh, does auto-nonsing on a context-sensitive uh, templating system. And the module loaders, they propagate the nonces. They use uh, safe types internally. Um, and basically, when you create a new application on that framework, the developer doesn't even need to know that there is a CSP, right? Uh, it just works out of the box. But it was quite some journey there. Um, but I think it was worth the effort. And with the CSP coverage going up, we also saw bugs being mitigated, so. Cool, so the other question is, have you had any successful XSS attempt against an L4 policy? 
So Absolutely. <laughs> yes. The L4 policy is a non-only policy, right? Without anything else. Yes, uh, uh, we, we do, uh, of course. So uh, I would say there are maybe two main kinds. Like one is when you have uh, an injection in the uh, script SRC, so in the source attribute of a script that is actually nonced or blindly nonced. And another is when uh, actually you can upload user content on the same origin. Uh, and um, so for example, if you can uh, upload uh, like uh, some JavaScript or SVG or some HTML, uh, and you can uh, actually embed this, uh, this might be a problem. Or of course you can instruct the, the, the victim to go there directly. Uh, so, but this is a little bit out of scope because uh, it's actually a covered problem. It becomes covered, oh, yes. covered problems. And the blindly so nonsing is, is one. Yes, so the user upload is actually mostly a problem for non-Chrome because Chrome, if you have a nonce-only policy, also blocks the PDFs and this kind of stuff. But I think yes, to get also with the, with the object SRC. And yeah. there are also the plugins. And so XSS is, is really, really complex, right? Uh, it's very hard to say we can cover 100%. And it's also not the aim of a, of a mitigation technique, right? But we can cover a lot, and we can cover a lot in, in, a, in a pretty effective way. So I think the TLDR for level for policy is if the developer nonces a script and still puts something untrusted, uh, user controllable input into SRC, it's, it's still bypassable, right? Web awesome. Uh, which, where, which one is it? This one. Uh, WebASM, yes. Uh, it appears that non-space policies work for execution of WebASM. Is that correct? If so, uh, I am now very happy. Uh, I think for WebASM, you have to have unsafe evil to allow it to execute. Uh, I think they were discussing about an unsafe WASM directive, but I think it's not part of the specification yet. More directives. So. Yes, so it is possible, but you have to put unsafe evil. Do your bug bounty researchers still report XSS bugs even if they can't bypass CSP? Yes, they do, and yes, they should, because they're still getting paid. And if they also bypass the CSP, I think they get paid extra. So please don't stop reporting bugs. 